This is One on One. Here we go, folks. Uh, this is Dr. Mark Benton, Medical Director, Inpatient Sleep Services at Summit Medical Group. Good to see you, Doctor. Nice to meet you. Some people have told me um, a little bit, I'm not going to make it this about me, they say you can be a little bit cranky on tape day. You know, and I realized, hey, last night I didn't go to sleep till about 1 o'clock thinking about today. Got up early, tried to exercise. I figured it doesn't matter how much sleep I got, I'll be fine. I'm starting, it's the middle of the afternoon. I'm, I'm fading. What's up? The amount of sleep you get matters and the quality of the sleep that you get matters. And most of us don't get enough and a lot of us don't get it uh, restoratively enough. And it does affect you. No question but, about but it. What's, it's not, eight hours is not happening. Eight hours happens for some. Uh, the average person, adult, six and a half to eight hours, eight and a half hours would be enough if we're able to get it. And again, it has to be good. But you're right. A lot of people don't get eight hours. A lot of people don't get anywhere as near that. And unfortunately, you can't make it up on weekends, particularly when you're an adult. So you Time have to pay up. some attention. I'm sorry for interrupting. You've got to go back. What do you mean you can't make it up? I've been thinking I'm making it up on weekends all the time. You can try, but it doesn't really work. You end up with a sleep debt, and by the end of the year, let's say Thursday, Friday, you're sort of a mess. So if you slept four or five hours and you say, listen, I'm going to sleep in a little later on a weekend, and you do it one or two times, and you made up those hours, and together it adds up to six and a half, it, <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. By the end of the week, you're in a sleep debt, which affects you cognitively and physically. You'll feel better on the weekend when you sleep longer, but it won't help you any uh, later in the week. Uh, go back. You said it, help, it hurts us cognitively. What do you mean? Any, any situation with sleep deprivation based on either not getting enough sleep or getting poor sleep will affect you cognitively. So let's say that your body needs seven or eight hours of sleep. If you get five to six hours of sleep per night every night on a consistent basis or even average it out over a week, there's a cumulative debt that occurs. And what can end up happening is that once you're full into that debt, you'll be in a situation where, and they've looked at this cognitively in terms of reaction time, you're functioning like somebody who hasn't slept at all the night before. You're functioning like somebody with a .08 alcohol level, depending upon what you're looking at. But the fact is, it happens to most of us, and because it's the state that we all exist in, we don't see it, because you don't know what normal is, except What's for maybe that vacation you take. I hear you. Quality versus quantity. What do you mean? Well, quality is when you sleep. Uh, is your sleep interrupted? Is it fragmented? And there are a million things that can do that. In the practice of sleep medicine, we deal with sleep apnea, which is a condition where 10, 20, 50, 100 times an hour, you have a small awakening or an arousal because your breathing becomes irregular. And that, obviously, is going to fragment your sleep. Limb movements, chronic pain, um, and a variety of other things can interfere with the sleep. And then there's the duration of the sleep which is you, a secondary issue. Why did you connect sleep apnea with golf, a sport I love? I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, where, where? Actually, straightforward, two, a couple of reasons for that. First of all... Why, I'm thinking about the three-foot putt I missed all night? Is that the problem? It's not that you're thinking about the three-foot putt. It's your ability to concentrate, your ability to remember, your ability to make decisions, your ability to leave the uh, anger behind. Uh, what anger? How, oh, you've talked to my friends. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You, so, you and everybody else. So the frustration, you take it with you? you? Of course you do. And it's easier when your brain is functioning well, when you're on all cylinders, to function in a variety of uh, venues, regardless of whether it's work. I mean, what's golf? Golf is decision-making, <laughs> endurance. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's uh, cognitive it's function. It's the ability to focus and then function appropriately. Sleep, to a large degree, will control that. Poor sleep will affect that. And the same thing would be true at work. The same thing is true socially, and the same thing is true at school. Okay, so give us some advice here. There are times that I look at the iPhone or the iPad a little bit after midnight, and I'm in trouble after that. Because? Because the blue light, number one, stimulates you neurochemically to be alert. That's number one. Number two, Getting engaged with something cognitively is going to make it much harder for you to wind down and go through what should be a bedtime routine. If you're having problems getting to sleep at night, you want to develop an institute and then reassess some kind of a routine to wind yourself down within 30 to 60 minutes towards your anticipated bedtime. Regularity of a routine is exactly 
what's going to lead you towards the best possible outcome with regards to sleep. Now, if you have a lifestyle, as many people do, whether it's shift work or whether it's, it's having to get up early, having to do a day sure. of interviews, you, you're going to have problems the night before. So how do you deal with that? Well, number one, if you're sleeping well all the other nights, you'll be more tolerant of one night of less sleep, usually. Number two, if you're having underlying sleep problems, as a global problem, you start paying some attention to that because any improvement that you make is going to help. And then number three, if you know you're going to have certain problems on a given day, you have to develop your own routine and figure out what works best for you and then try to implement that as a standard approach. Question. <clears throat> Georgette, did you ask this? Georgette, our great producer, um, drinks, what do you drink? How many glasses of wine before you go to sleep? No, she, stop joking. She, she, she has a glass of wine. I think it's red. And she thinks, I'm chill. I'm good. You say? Alcohol has all sorts of impact here. Oh. Certainly, the I more you help drink, you get tired and go the more, it helps you fall asleep. Not for good reasons, but it helps you fall asleep. <laughs> but what ends up happening is that, number one, on a single time or infrequent basis, it interferes with sleep continuity and the remainder of your sleep is bad. If you drink chronically, large amounts or excessive amounts, then it completely destroys the architecture or the configuration of your sleep and the restorative nature. If you happen to have sleep apnea, <clears throat> as 25 or 30 percent of adult males do, it makes your apnea considerably worse, making your sleep worse. Before I let you out of here, Dr. Ben, um, by the way, this is, uh, if you listen on the audio side, Dr. Mark Benton, medical director in sleep, sir, uh, in, inpatient sleep services at Summit Medical Group. Um, I could ask you something. My wife is able to fall asleep largely when I start telling her a story and I'm in the middle of it and I realize she's sleeping. Should I keep doing that? Maybe we could package that and you could sell <laughs> that to people as a sleep aid. If someone says they fall asleep watching one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be very upset by that. Doctor, this is really, in all seriousness, this is very helpful. I'm going to thank you. My pleasure. Well done. This is one-on-one. -on -one. I'm Steve Adubato. Stay awake. We'll be right back after this.